Good morning and welcome. Happy Friday. My name is Jess Jones. I am the center director with the Coffer Resource Center based here in Chicago, Illinois. We are the nonprofit resource arm that supports union performers in the pursuit of work. Um, we are here working with SAG after equity and beyond uh, in this time of remote work uh, that we're still mostly experiencing and we are happy to be here with you virtually. Um, before we get started a little about us, uh, you can stay tuned into programs such as this as well as other events that we have planned by subscribing to our newsletter. You can go to coffercenterchicago.com, head down to the middle to the Coffer headliner and subscribe there. Our newsletter will come right to your inbox so you don't have to go looking for information. It will come directly to you when you want to know what else we have in store. Um, if you are more social in nature, we invite you to follow us on social media. You could do so on Facebook and Instagram at Coffer Center. Uh, just, just our name, Coffer Center, K-A-U-F-H-E-R-R. -R. Um, so look us up, follow us, stay tuned in, be part of the conversation. We want to connect with you outside of these four walls of uh, Zoom and beyond. And uh, we would love to know that you're out there. So please hit us up in the comments, uh, send us a message, let us know what we can do to connect with you. Uh, speaking of connecting, Welcome to Soundcheck. I love to connect in the space each Friday. Uh, I've said many times before, this is a nice bookend to my week, easing into the weekend. It is the thing that I enjoy and miss uh, about being in the physical space, which is connecting with creatives, hearing what they've been up to, hearing what creative products of their lives and careers look like, um, and especially now during this time where there's so much reinvention at the wheel. Um, and I'm so grateful to my friend, Dr. Greta Pope, uh, for bringing this series to the Copper Center. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Greta Pope to the screen. Um, I am I am so happy to spend this hour or so with Greta each week. It's, you know, it is a balm of conversation that just eases into the weekend. Hi, Greta. How are you this morning? I'm great, Jess. How are you? I'm good. I, the moment that I saw you this morning, I feel like your color is like what the world feels like right now. Like you just feel yeah. like the, the sun is shining <laughs> outside my window. And yeah, so I feel like you've costumed for the, oh, the season. Perfect. The weather is beautiful. It's going to be beautiful all weekend. And you know, what more could we ask? Except That's maybe not... for the pandemic to be over. But aside oh, right. from well, the, moving yes. in the right direction. <laughs> well, all, all kinds of gratitude is relative to the moment, right? So we That's can be right. grateful. Yeah. My uh, <laughs> my son has two back-to-back -back soccer games tomorrow. So I'm great. He had a rain rain cancellation last week. So they've padded them this week. And I'm like, you know what? I think on a Saturday evening, I don't mind sitting for two consecutive games out at Montrose Harbor because it's gonna be you it's gonna be nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So That's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. So your family's doing well. Everybody's doing well. We are. We are doing well. We actually, my my son turned twelve this week, and he's getting oh. Pfizer dose one today. So mm -hmm. it's you know lots of lots all things again all things relative. Lots of minor monumental things happening in our house. So we're good over here. And how are things by you? Really good. No complaints. Good. No complaints. Thrilled that the weather's getting nice and just very happy. Feeling very chipper today. Well, good. Well, I am going to pass the torch over to you oh, and let you guide us into our hour with Deb Dotzer. Sounds wonderful. Thank you, Jess. Hey there, and welcome to Soundcheck. I'm Dr. Greta Pope, and I'm so excited to have this opportunity to visit with creatives from a variety of disciplines about their professional journey. We are in the midst of a pandemic that has changed all of our lives and the ways in which we work. We will use this forum to share our thoughts, feelings, and best practices for surviving this challenging time. I am very excited today to have an opportunity to visit with Deb Dotzer. Deb is a voice actor extraordinaire with a long list of impressive credits to her name, including national commercials, premier video game projects, narration, audiobooks, and so much more. She is an adjunct professor uh, at Columbia College, at DePaul University. She's at the Acting Studio Chicago, and she has originated voice courses at Second City Training Center. Let's welcome Deb Dotzer to Soundcheck. Hi. Hi, Deb. Hi. How are you? Good, I'm good, yeah. What a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks That's for awesome. having me. 
Absolutely. Lots of good questions for you. And I'm sure we're going to get lots of good information. Excellent. So let's jump right in. Tell us about your childhood. Where did you grow up? Did you act as a child? Uh, How did you become interested in acting? Wow. Okay. Um, I grew up in Baldwin, Long Island, New York. So there's a little bit of the accent. Um, and, you know, as a kid, I mean, I had a Panasonic tape recorder. Do you remember those? It was yeah. red. I wanted yellow. They were out, but, you know, so I got the red. And my best friend and I would create, you know, radio plays. One of our favorite one was Upstairs, doo-doo, Upstairs, as opposed to Upstairs, Downstairs. Which was- <laughs> yeah, just Upstairs. And when people were walking, we'd whistle, you know, it's like, I'm going to go to the other room. <laughs> you know, whatever. I can't <laughs> but, um, so uh, in fourth grade, I did a play um, and the sixth graders came to see it. I don't know why the whole school didn't, but this, or maybe they did, but the sixth graders had to write us letters um, saying, you know, and one guy wrote, uh, and I've kept two of the letters, but the one that I I remember the most is he was like, I I really like Debbie, because I went by that Debbie back then, Debbie Dozer, because I think she's going to be a big star someday. Uh That didn't quite come true, but I, I was like, oh, hmm. Yeah. So I, so I took, you know, kind of kids acting classes, um, did some work, and then went off to college uh, to, to have, for a BFA in, at, in acting, decided I didn't like w- the school I was at, transferred, and got a double major in English because I've always been fascinated by literature and words and sounds, and, um, and so a double major in English and theater arts and kind of fell into voiceover because it wasn't really a thing where, you know, now you can take classes, but, yeah. you know, back then it was just, somebody was like, you've got a cool voice. Have you ever thought about doing voiceover? And I was like, I don't even know what that is, dude. <laughs> and then, you know, he invited me to audition for something. I did, I booked it. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm hooked. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So, yeah, it's really a thing. Yeah. It's really a thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, what was your very first job as a voice actor? Do you remember? Uh, well, it was that one. The, oh, that one. So, so I did an improv workshop and um, decided it wasn't for me because I'd done improv comedy and I wanted to use it as a more serious tool. And this guy called me up out of the blue and was like, "Hi, we did this workshop together." And he was the one. He said, "I think you have a cool voice." And uh, so I went in and I auditioned for him and it was um, like a radio talk show, but kind of like a fake one. They'd have real doctors answering questions about medical conditions, but they had different actors calling in and being kind of silly. Um, And I was the know-it-all medical student. And um, I did a couple of sessions and it was a non-union gig, but it was $200 for like 20 minutes worth of work. And I didn't have to wear a costume or makeup or put contact lenses in. And I was like, mm, mm. like you know, <laughs> um, so that was my very first job. And I got to be like, um, so what is the difference between type one and type two diabetes? And, you know, blah, 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 I think you're wrong. You know, it says here in my medical journal. So it was just, you know, and then I went on to do, you know, some more silly radio type stuff. This was I lived in Boston where I went to school. Um, and then when I moved here, that was what I really wanted to focus on was voiceover. Oh, that's yeah. great. And what brought you to the Chicago area? Well, living in Boston, it's a, it's a beautiful place to live and I loved it, but it's a small market. Yeah. And not to say that I was a big fish, but um, I was doing equity theater at the time. And uh, when the theater was dark, everyone who was in the show with me, I was like 24, 25, they were all at least 20 years older than me and had families and homes in the Boston area. And then they all rented an apartment together and they'd drive down to New York after our show on Sunday, we were dark on Monday, go and audition for things like Law and Order and anything else that New York had to offer and then come back on Tuesday so we could do the show. And I was like, you know, I don't own property. I don't have kids, uh, you know. Um, so like about three years after that, I was like, well, where can I go? 
And at the time, I didn't really know anybody out in LA. And I really thought of it as just film, you know, film work. And I was really into the voiceover thing. And I had always liked improv comedy. So I was like, you know, there's New York, LA, Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. Really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at least at that time, that was, you know, so um, New York, I grew up outside of it. I love New York City, but I also know how ridiculously expensive and difficult it can be to live there. And I had a college friend who lived in Chicago. He's an actor. And he was like, it's great here. You can get a big apartment, you know? And my boyfriend at the time and a friend of mine and I came here and like looked for an apartment and decided let's make a change. So that's- Wow. That's that's here. Yeah. That's a great story. So, <laughs> it is. I mean, you know, it's, it's funny how life leads you in certain directions that, you know, you don't know what's going to happen for your career, but it turns out to be a great thing. It's wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it really, it really was. And just a little sidebar in like the mid nineties, I got moved here in the early nineties, 93. And then around 1997, you know, I was like, hmm, maybe I do want to go to LA because um, a, a friend of mine had moved out there and she's like, there's voiceover everywhere, girl. I've got a good friend who's got a home studio. So I had inherited a little bit of money, but enough that I didn't have to. So I went out there and lived for three months and really liked it, at, you know, but I was, you know, I was pretend living there, you know, um, and I was planning on moving and then, um, you know, and uh, this may be not PC, but I was dating someone and came back from my trip and I got pregnant. Uh -oh, okay. And I was like, okay, but I mean, Everything happens for a reason. That's right. That's right, right before I went out to LA, I had submitted voice demos, just kind of like here. Mm -hmm. And while I was in LA, I got two of the agents in town were like, are you coming back? What's the story? And I was like, oh, that sounds, that's nice. So I came back and signed with one of those agents and then went on to be very happy that I didn't move to LA at that time. Yeah, that's so. fantastic. Yeah, things do happen for a reason. Yep, you never know which, how your life's gonna, you know, what path you're gonna take for sure. That's right, that's right. So today, what has been your most memorable or fun voice acting job? Huh, well, um, the most memorable and fun was really pretty recent, you know. Oh. Um, Greta, I'm a woman of a certain age. So, um, you know, at this point in my career, I joke around and say, you know, oh, I'm, I'm auditioning for Depends ads and <laughs> diabetes supplies. But, um, you know, I guess I'd like to say that, you know, even when you hit a certain age, your dreams never die. That's, just, that's a really important thing to remember. During the pandemic last May, I got a call from a New York number, didn't pick it up because I'm like, oh, I don't know who that is. Listen, then, you know, I was bringing my son in the house, whatever. So we came in, um, I listened to the message and he's looking at me and he's like, mom, are you okay? Because apparently the color was draining from my face. And I was like, I think I'm booked on a Disney animation. I know, right? And I was like, I, I don't know. And it was my, so I'm with Stuart here in town and it was Stuart, New York. And I called them back and they were like, yeah, congratulations. You're going to be on the Owl House. Yeah. So I recorded my character um, in my home closet um, with all the technical difficulties one can have. I had, we did a little session to use Source Connect, went great. Day of the actual session, did not go great. Had to end up using Zoom. Um, did an ADR session, right? Where you're, you know, kind of lip matching to some of the animation where my Wi-Fi just decided to go crazy, but they were lovely. Um, it was directed by a woman, um, written and produced by a woman, you know, so it was very, the engineer was a dude, but um, and no offense to dudes. I love dudes, <laughs> but it was just so nice to be in an, you know, kind of woman power, woman centric with kind of a, woman, you know, in girl centered animation. And it was really like, you know, sure it would have been totally sexy to be in the actual studio, but um, you know, it made me go, yeah, you know, you never, you just don't know with this That's career. Right. You don't know what path, you know. Um, I've done little animated things, but this is like the biggest, you know. Wow. 
That's thing. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll be on season two. Um, so far, I'm in three episodes. So hopefully, they'll keep me recurring. But um, wonderful. Well, that's that's great. We'll be watching for you. That's fantastic. Yay, thank you. Yeah, it was, it was really pretty awesome. Yeah, at least right. Yeah, yeah that is very cool. Very cool. So you're on the faculty at Columbia College and DePaul and mm -hmm. Acting Studio Chicago, and you originated voice courses at Second City Training Center. How exciting is that? I know. Yeah. So what are some of the most common pieces of advice that you give to artists who are starting out? Okay. Well, one of the most important things I say is control what you can control, because so much of what we do is about auditioning and never knowing, and nobody's going to tell you whether you did a good job. Um, not even your agent, you know, you send it in, they'll let you know if the sound quality was bad, they'll let you know if you went over time, they'll let you know if it sucked, but they're not going to be like, oh my God, Greta, that was the best audition ever. Thanks for sending it in. You know, our fingers are crossed for you. No, you don't get any of that. <laughs> or rarely, every now and again. Um, so, you know, you can, you can control certain things. You can control, like years ago, when my son was attempting to do some acting work, which after a certain point, I was like, I'm not a stage mom. Um, they, they said, we just tell our kids that everything is a job. You know, if you have an audition, it's a job. Yeah. Which, and I think that's a really good way to handle your business. It is your job to audition. That's right. It's kind of a bonus when you get the gig, right? That's right. That's right. And you got to love the process and you can control that. You can do your due diligence with the script. You can make sure that your home recording setup or whatever you're using is, is of the best quality you can afford at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you can, you know, you, you know, like I said, do the due diligence with the script and that kind of thing. Um, when you show up, when you get the session, you can, you know, act professionally, show up on time. Same thing if you're going into audition, you know, all those things. So you control what you can control because everything else is out of control. Um, the other thing I would tell newbies, I mean, most of them are taking a class, but because classes are available now, agents expect they're, they're not going to hold your hand like they used to, you know. Um, so they want you ready to go. So take a class with a reputable person, um, you know, put together a showcase for your little demo for yourself that showcases you as you are right now. And so many people want to do animation and gaming and fun character voices, but really where the money is, and especially here in Chicago, it's commercially, you, they want you being you, variations of you with different points of view. So try to steer yourself away from, you know, putting on a demo, something like, you know, oh, blah, 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 blah. you know, they don't care, <laughs> you know, start off with you. Even if you can do a great British accent, don't do it. If you want, if you have to do it, put it at the end of the demo, you oh. know? So That's very good. Those are very good recommendations. Oh, very thank good you. Recommendations. <laughs> yeah, these are some of the questions that I was going to ask you, you know, and, and I will, I will, you know, ask some of them just so we can delve a little bit more deeply yeah. into your responses to this. But I, that's fantastic information. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think a lot, you know, a lot of newbies don't, they're, they all think voiceover. So they think it's all about how many crazy voices I can do, oh. mm -hmm. you know, and one of my greatest satisfactions as a teacher, I think is when like I had a student just this past semester and he came in and he does have a very big deep voice, blah, blah, blah. And he came in doing that. And I was like, yeah, you're good, you know, but, and, but that's not really going to be useful. And I watched him really working on his own voice. And um, I have them write a final paper where they kind of sum up the semester for themselves. And he was like, that was the most eye-opening thing. And it was really exciting to work on my own voice and really figure out what it sounds like. Cause I think, especially college kids, I know I was cast as the fat, funny old lady all through high school, mm -hmm. even a little bit in college. And then I get out in the real, the real world and I'm like, oh, I'm 23. And the fat, funny old ladies, I'm not going to play that until yeah. like now, maybe, yeah. if even. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think a lot of 
colleges prepare you for the real world, you know? So, and I think, you know, these kids come out of high school and they have those big pipes. So they play every announcer and every school project. And then they, you know, they think that they can continue to use that and it's not really going to be viable, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think what you're saying um, about colleges preparing students, I think that's true in, in many areas. Certainly um, in the singing area, it is true, you know, that, that uh, students are prepared, they're, they're given wonderful technical skills. Mm -hmm. but then they get out into the world and they need to figure out how to realistically apply those skills in the marketplace. So, you yeah. know, I think it's great that you are, are you know, talking to your students about that because it's, it's important. It's important. It's really important. And I mean, and it's harder now, I think, for singers, everybody to be able to learn on the job. Yeah. You know, like I did. And I don't know, were you a jingle singer back in the day? Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. And I think jingle singing, there was so much of it that, you know, you would you were doing things every day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing voiceover stuff. Not yeah. every day, but, you know, and I got to work with people who would use a little bit of improv in their audition and I was like oh I can do that teaching that is really hard you know because everybody wants to do it right yes and a lot of air quotes today but um yeah so I think you know they don't get enough experience so I try to be like try to break down what the reality is so they're not like wait a minute I thought I was gonna get an agent and be a big star right. you know hopefully right. thankfully I've not had anybody come back and want to kick my butt about <laughs> Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, woo, fingers crossed. It keeps keeps that's up. Going. Good. So, what recommendations would you give to artists like your students as they plan to prepare and record their demos? How should they be selecting their material? Well, generally, you know, you would hire a demo producer who would select it for you. Okay. Um, but I always say a good demo producer, it should be a collaborative experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't have somebody being like, no, this is what you sound like, because then you're not gonna, you need to, f you, first of all, you need to have taken a class. So you kind of get an idea of like, hey, I was pretty good at this and this and this, mm -hmm. not so good at that. Yeah. Um, like Columbia, I don't teach this class, but Columbia College has a demo production class that most of the voiceover students take. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so they find scripts for themselves like on iSpot.tv and other places that are current mm -hmm. um, that they think matches what their voice print is and the different sides of it. So I would say to people, you know, take a class, figure out what you think you're good at, um, what your voice can do without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. That's your signature sound. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what you would want to lead with on a demo. Okay. And you only get like a minute. And then you want to show various sides. Maybe it's me doing high energy stuff or me being really serious and delivering a PSA, you know? Oh, yeah. um, you know, depending on where you fit. Maybe I'm a, I'm a mom who's, you know, fed up or, you know, worried about college tuition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and pick products that you yourself would buy. Or your peer group would buy, right? Like, you know, fast food is everywhere. If you're in your 20s, do a fast food commercial. Yeah. Anyone will do, you know, Taco Bell, McDonald's, Wendy's, find one that works for you. Um, so, you know, because advertising is all about demographics, right? So peers advertise, advertise to peers, right? So if you're 22 and you're trying to do a Lexus ad, yeah. I'm not going to buy it because <laughs> right. last year, like a trust fund kid, right. <laughs> you right. can't afford that shit, right? You know what I mean? Right. Afford Escape, great. You know, a Honda Civic, yeah, maybe. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's great. So, yeah. Right. So, so you would suggest that people show versatility, but versatility within uh, a particular category. Yeah. You want to show versatility in, you know, in, in your like point of view. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Like, yeah, I tend to kind of, I mean, in case you haven't figured it out, like I've got a little bit of a raspy voice and I'm kind of sarcastic. So, you know, when I started out, that was a really great thing to have. So it was easy for me. Wasn't so easy for me to do um, touchy feely medical mm -hmm. stuff. And my agents yeah. were like, you got to work on that. You always sound mad. 
Uh -huh. It wasn't until I went through real life experiences with illness and, and people getting ill and then dying that I was like, oh, that's it. This is the kind of sound they want. They want somebody who yeah. is has the authority to speak yeah. about these things, but also has a compassionate side. It's not like, oh, I feel sorry for you, which yeah. is kind of where I was going. Yeah. So it's kind of understanding that point of view and presenting it. And mic technique, you know, getting a little closer for a more intimate sound, yeah. pulling away to give a little bit of room and ambience to make it more real person. Yeah. Um, yeah, just finding those different things that you're like, I relate to that. And I get that that point of view. And, you know, it depends on your voice print and all of that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. a, a good demo producer will guide you through. That's great. That's great. That's good to know. Yeah. Now, you've been cited as the best vocal coach in Chicago by Backstage. Yeah. I know, right? I, I, I didn't pay anybody to say <laughs> that. <laughs> I love it. That's great. That's great. So if people are seeking help getting their voice careers going, how can they reach out to you for coaching or some kind of direction as to, you know, how they should move forward? Um, well, they can just email me. Okay. Um, we'll, it, we'll put this in the chat, Jess. I'll put it oh, at Deb Dotzer, which is just my name, all lowercase, D2 at gmail.com. And there's a D2 because I had a Deb Dotzer at Gmail, could not for the life of me remember the password, got so mad. Just, yeah, so this, this is what I have. I'm like, forget it, forget it. So who knows? Who knows who's emailing that? But there's a little D2 at the end there. There okay. it is. That's yeah. great. Okay, thanks, Jess, or Henrique, or whoever did it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, a number of people have expressed interest in recording audiobooks. Mm -hmm. What advice can you give for becoming involved in that area of work? That is a, a whole different animal in a way. Um, agents, at least here in Chicago, don't really handle it because it's not enough bang for their buck, um, like a commercial would be, or you know, because they were getting ten percent of your, you know, your yeah. earning. Yeah. Um, so what I would suggest, I always like, nowadays I would say take a class. It gives you a nice overview. And what you can do is compare yourself, not that you want to compare yourself, like, am I better than them? But you can kind of watch everybody else learning and go, oh, they're really good. Or, wow, I'm pretty good when I'm, you know, you kind of get an idea of, you know, first thing you should do, a guy named Sean Pratt, who's an audiobook narrator says, go into your closet with a book and read it out loud for an hour. Yeah. If you don't go completely cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, audiobook narration may be for you. Um, it's a lot of work. You need a lot of vocal stamina. You need to really take care of your voice and, and understand your instrument and understand your limitations with it. Um, so if you do go in and read for an hour and you're like, I could read for two more hours, great. If you go in and read for an hour and your voice is fatigued and you feel like crap, you know, because if you work with a producer, and you're going into studio, you will record like an eight hour day with a lunch break mm -hmm. because they wanna kind of get it all done. They don't wanna pay you. If you're gonna be doing it from home, you can kind of build your own schedule, but there's deadlines. Yeah. Um, I know Acting Studio has a class with Natalie Duke, um, which is great, she's great. There's a website called acx.com. Uh, that is run by Audible and Amazon. It's a little bit of the Wild West, um, but it's free. So you can go and sort of search around and, and um, you have to, in order to audition for anything, you have to have a, a profile, but they don't charge you. Um, but you can kind of just tool around and see, you know, how that works for you. Um, there's also a site called ahabtalent.com, which... Um, is mostly for the audiobooks industry. Um, you wanna put together a little bit of a sample of you reading. Um, so I would suggest three samples to start. One would be like a third person omniscient narrator setting a scene. You know, like Bill walks down the street. It was a dark and stormy night, blah, blah, blah. Um, about a minute to two minutes in length. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of places will ask for longer than that, but I think that's enough to get an idea. Second one, you wanna show separation of character. 
So pick a different book, um, preferably a male and a female character, right? Men don't have to sound like this and women don't have to sound like this, you know? Um, you don't want a Monty Python it. Find it in the, in the, you know, in the words, in the description, right? He had a dusky Southern accent. He was a slow talker. She talked really fast. She was from Brooklyn, right? It'll be in there somewhere. So you wanna show that you can do these, you know, you can separate characters. Um, and it's subtle, doesn't have to be big. And then the third sample I would suggest um, is uh, a nonfiction, something that you're, you're in, invested and interested in because that will come through, right? Because even the most bland nonfiction that you can think of, somebody is interested in it. And they're, you know, so you have to elicit that excitement about the most boring stuff. Um, if you have any kind of special skills, like you speak another language or whatever, find, especially for that nonfiction piece, find something that if you can speak Italian, it's set in Rome and you can throw out all those, you know, Italian words trippingly off the tongue, right? <laughs> um, so those are the places to start. Um, you know, just know that you get paid per finished hour. I think the union rate is like 230 or 250, somewhere in that range for per finished hour. And per finished hour means an hour's worth of recorded audio, edited, ready to go. Yeah. Does not count reading the book and reading it again and marking up your copy and figuring yeah. out your voices and pronunciations of things. So, or editing if you're at home working on it. And so there's a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I get, you know, people go, well, why would I want to do that? <laughs> I'm like, well, there you go. There's your answer. But other people really love to read and love to do it. And as they get better and are making more money and having more projects, they can farm things out to people like read that book for me and edit, you know, they pay for it, but yeah. they've got a lot of irons in the fire so they, they can afford to do it. You know, That's great. That's great. Wonderful advice. Wonderful advice. Uh, so how has the voice business changed during the pandemic? Has this change been difficult to navigate for you? and for other professional voice artists that you've interacted with during this time? Have you spoken with a lot of people and what, what's kind of the word on the street about changes and maybe changes going forward uh, for this business? Yeah, well, you know, for most of us here in Chicago, especially, you know, union performers who have been working for a while, many of us already had some sort of a home recording setup, mm -hmm. whether, you know, it was state of the art or not, yeah. you know, and, it, you know, most of us have grown it to a certain place. So for us, it was to translate it over to doing jobs from home really was just about how do we connect in real time with whoever we're working with, whether it be it Source Connect, you know, uh, Zoom, you know, uh, Skype, whatever. Yeah. And some of us were already doing things like that here and there. Um, so that didn't really change much and the working from home you know, it was very weird. It felt almost like, oh yeah, we were headed this way. Yeah. You know, I hate to say it in a way, but mm -hmm. people had been doing it. Yeah. You know, um, I think it was a bigger deal out in LA because people didn't really work from home. They would go into audition at their agent who had like a booth director who would direct them. Yeah. Um, some people had home studios out there, have home studios, but a lot of those people were doing promo and TV imaging work and had like consistent clientele and had to be at the ready. So I think, you know, like I saw um, Phil Lamar, who's a uh, animation and gaming voice actor, very prolific. He was like, oh my God, I, he was recording on a Yeti Blue uh, from home, which is a, a good mic, a good starter mic, but not necessarily yeah. like a great. Yeah, so, yeah. and a lot of studios and, and uh, produce, you know, people producing work were sending people equipment if they didn't have it. I was like, darn, I wish I didn't have any equipment. <laughs> um, so in a way, voiceover was the one thing that didn't stop mm -hmm. with the pandemic. In fact, it got a little bit busier. Um, so that was nice. Then it kind of got slow again mm -hmm. because 
people, especially in LA who were like on TV shows or just film actors, all of a sudden they had no work. So they said to their agent, put me on some voiceover stuff. So all of a sudden you're like, what happened to all the audition? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so I don't know. Years ago, I was uh, doing a workshop and I had a student go, tell me what voiceover was like five years ago today and five years, what do you think five years from now? And I was like, ooh, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, I don't want to say this because I love my agents and I think they're really important in all aspects, but voiceover is becoming increasingly more online, digital, you know, click a button, do this. Um, <laughs> So I feel like the union and agents really should get together and go, okay, we gotta, we gotta kind of figure out what's happening here or else it's all gonna become the wild west, unfortunately. Yeah, wow, yeah. wow. that's interesting. That's yeah. interesting, wow. So tell us a little bit more about your home studio. Are you producing broadcast quality work or do you do your work out for post-production or how are you doing it? I, I feel like, I mean, you know, the, um, the feedback I've gotten is like, well, pretty good sound quality. It was a process, you know, as anything is. Um, I was lucky enough to be gifted a really nice Shure KMS, I can never remember the numbers, but a nice studio mic. Um, bought a Scarlett interface for that. Prior to that, I was just using a USB because I was mostly just doing auditions. Um, I started off with a fabric cube <laughs> with some sound panels in it and my little yeah, blue Yeti and I would, you know, do it in my dining room because I lived in a little tiny place. Mm -hmm. Then I got a closet, small, but I could do it. Still had the cube, but clothes, okay. Now I actually have a dedicated space that has like acoustic tile Ooh. that I kind of put that double-sided tape and stuck it all up there. Okay. Um, and a light, which is very cool. One of those sensor lights. It's bright, awesome. And my, I have a Mac, so it's pretty quiet. You got to watch out for, you know, fans and stuff. But my little MacBook Air seems to be good. And I put my little, there was a shelf, perfectly sized. Wow. Put thing there, plug all my stuff in, shut my closet door. And uh, I'm good to go. That's great. Uh, a good friend of mine, because I'm not, you know, I didn't study audio engineering. Nobody who does voiceover really has, maybe a handful of people. So I have a good friend who's a, an audio engineer. He and I also produce demos together and he uh, helps people set up home studios. So he kind of came and set all my levels for me and showed me what they were and this is the best way to do it. So that I didn't have to, you know, if you want your tech to be, I don't have to think about it. Yeah, and consistent. Yeah. Consistent, you go in and you just do your thing because that's yeah. the important part. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so that's kind of the, the evolution. People always think that the, the recording software is the most important thing. It is not. Mm -hmm. You can record on GarageBand, you can record on Audacity, it's free. Um, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. The mm -hmm. mic is important. You want a good, decent mic and the soundproofing is the most important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's yeah. great. This is wonderful advice. <laughs> it's really hands-on good stuff for people to be able to use, you know. Yeah, well then, you know, that's my job. Grab <laughs> tell the people the real stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were chatting a little bit before we started today about how you have adapted your voice classes to the pandemic. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how your classes ordinarily work and how you've managed to meet the class objectives virtually. Well, I just saw that Brian Plaharchek made a comment in here. Hi, Brian, yes, give <laughs> Hey Kressel. Dave Kressel is the man. Um, Brian and I both teach at Columbia, so we teach the same class. So we always kind of confer and go, what are you gonna do? Um, and we you know, follow a, a, the same syllabus, but we kind of do it in our own way. So the learning objectives, I think, pretty much stay the same. I mean, you know, it's how, you know, breaking down copy. I don't have the learning objectives in front of me, but breaking down copy, understanding the different types of commercial copy and animation and gaming and audiobooks we touch on. Um, 
you know, we have an agent and we have Kathy Byrne from sag After come in. So understanding what an agent does and what the union does and all that. So all of those are in the learning objective. So that was not something difficult to translate mm-hmm. over. Um, uh, the hardest part for me watching them is mic technique because they're all, some of them have a mic at home, some of them don't, yeah. um, you know, but getting them in that studio and showing them the distance and having that, ex- putting yeah. their script on the music stand as they would in a studio, they don't get. And that kind of sucks mm-hmm. because that's, that's a really important thing. I can talk about it, but they're not experiencing it. Yes. Um, when we're not in pandemic times, we take them to a professional studio um, for a class where they get to record in the booth and talk to the engineer. And so of course we couldn't do that. Um, but we substituted having Dave Kressel that Brian mentioned, uh, who's my engineer pal, come in and we do uh, a Source Connect Now session with them. So they don't have to buy anything, but no. they can get that experience, which yeah. I think was helpful even though it was kind of a pain in the neck and you know, sort of difficult, it was like herding cats to get them all to, um, and herding cats and trying to figure out because I was trying to do things with them while they all, and then I was like, no, I'm just gonna have us go, you, wait for your email, sit in yeah. front of your computer. And, um, but he, uh, some of them, you know, oh, I was running out of battery power. Yeah. Well, you gotta have your computer booted up, dum dum. Right. You know, or I didn't have my mic set up, right? You know, so yeah. they kind of got a real world how to troubleshoot stuff. Yeah, that can happen, right? And will happen. It will happen. So yeah. It's going to be smooth sailing. Um, so I feel like that was a kind of a helpful switch. Mm-hmm. Um, so that you know, if they down the road go, oh, source can yes. I I vaguely remember um, how to do that, you know? And you just have some real world experience since we can't take them to um, a studio. But other than that, I I really feel like other things translated pretty well, you know? It was mostly just the real world booth experience that we couldn't couldn't really have. Yeah, and then you were talking about being able to work with them one-on-one. And, and just scheduling them when to join the, the Zoom. Yeah. yeah, yeah, well, cause I feel like in, in a, even though I would do it in the class, you know, it was just hard because people would check out. I mean, like I said, people would check out even in the real class. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, and I felt like I wanted to do something a little bit special and make sure they all had a little time where I could really focus just on them. So. Yeah. It was usually just one class, but I would just schedule like 10 or 15 minutes and we'd right. work on some scripts and, you know, talk about stuff. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And how many students are in your class generally? 16. 16. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a nice workable number. That's good. It started out as 12, which yeah. is a much more workable number, which is <laughs> yeah. what the acting studio has. 16, it went up to 16 and, you know, it's a lot, especially the sea of faces, you know, yeah, yeah. Or, no, or no faces, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the, um, so you're not sure, you know, you're not really sure who's engaged and who's yeah. not, you yeah. know, I mean, in, in, you know, in the classroom, I can be like, can you put away your phone and pay attention? You know, cause I'm like these, all these directions I'm giving to that person Right. You know, to you. It'll help you down the road. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not just about them. Right. It's right. harder to do that, you know, with everybody, you know, and also, you know, we had to sort of be aware. I feel like we also had to be like counselors, which we have to be anyway, but we had to be aware of people's living circumstance, sure. what their, you know, what their Wi Fi was like. You know, people were popping in and out, you know, if they kept yeah. their, their screen off. It wasn't necessarily out of disrespect. It might have been, you know, they just didn't want us to see their environment, or they didn't feel comfortable in that place. Yeah. You know? Or maybe so, there are other people in the household that they're trying to preserve their privacy or whatever. Yeah, I mean, or other people working. I mean, like you know, I've got my my you know senior in high school in the other room. You know, so yeah. we all had our our constraints. Yeah. So you had to also be respectful of that and not That's judge right. someone if they never put their camera on. Absolutely. So tell me, speaking of your family, how have you kept your spirits up and how have you kept your family encouraged 
your children during this time? Ooh, well, it was hard. Um, I have an older son, he lives elsewhere. Um, and, you know, he, you know, he's 22. So he was kind of working. Mm -hmm. He dropped out of school because he didn't, he's going to an art school. He didn't want to go with it being online because he was oh. taking things like a darkroom photography class oh, yeah. and a 16 millimeter film class. And like, yeah, no, then it all had to go digital. He's like, I know how to do that. Yeah. Um, my younger son is a senior in high school. So ending his junior year, starting out senior year um, was hard, you know? I mean, in some ways I think he didn't mind being home cause he's, he's a bit shy and, you know, so, but after a certain point the, the, the illness factor was really big. You know, it was very hard and he, I think basically understandably, I mean, I'm a single mom. He, I think he just didn't want me to die. So he yeah. was very concerned about yeah. stuff. So, I mean, the good news was that I had to translate like four classes online. So I, I, right in the beginning, I was pretty busy because I was just starting like two weeks after we got on lockdown, a class at DePaul. So I had to, oh, oh no, we're freezing a little bit. We are? Uh -oh. I was, I don't know. Um, so I did translate. Yeah, my internet connection is unstable. I did translate two classes fully online that I wasn't expecting and then yeah. half class. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was good, but it kept me busy. So I was yeah. sort of, um, it really wasn't until this semester for me that I was like, oh my God. And I found that my students and my, everybody was like, can we just be done? Yeah, yeah, people are tired, they're fatigued. Yeah. <laughs> the good news was my son uh, got, into, got into college and got a really nice scholarship, yay. Great. So that kind of, he was like, yeah, I'm yeah. good. You know, so yeah. it wasn't like, you know, senior spirits, yeah. yeah. Senioritis sure. coupled with COVID, you know, coupled with getting, you know, a nice scholarship and going to a school you really want to go to. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, he was like, good. Yeah. I'm done. I know. That's you know. Fantastic. Yeah. So so. For all of us, a pandemic has been challenging, but it has also been a double edged sword for many, mm -hmm. allowing time and opportunity for new projects. So, have there been any silver lining things uh, about the pandemic for you? Have you had any opportunity to develop new skills or cultivate new interests or anything like that? Um, well, no new interests because I've been pretty busy teaching. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't get to do any sourdough bread cooking <laughs> or anything yeah. like that. But um, yeah, even though I totally didn't want to do it and teaching online was daunting, mm -hmm. um, you know, they always say that you need to learn something new to keep your brain going. So I learned a lot of new things. So that was good. I mean, and, and after it was all done, I felt like I had really accomplished something. Right. And then when I started to do the teaching and I felt like, oh, this is translating well and this works okay, that made me feel really good. Um, you know, other than that, I wish, I, I think the other silver lining for me was, you know, I'm working. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Yep. You know, I could have. Yeah, not been working. Yeah. And also my kids are older. Mm -hmm. Like if this had happened, I started teaching at Columbia in 09. So if this had happened yeah. in 09, yeah. nightmare city. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd have younger kids. Like I know I talked to Jess. I'm like, I don't know how you're doing it, girl. I, I know. know. I know. I know. It's really, it's really something. I don't, I don't know how women with children at home are managing it. I, you know, my hat is off to them without oh my it. gosh I know especially guy you know younger I mean I just go that would have been because they were like six and ten yeah, yeah. you yeah. know they need so much and you need to be yes. you know uh, I have an 18 year old like yeah he needs stuff but pretty much dude can get himself some food right. That's right. you know I mean so yeah so I just feel so blessed you know in that because even though it sucks for everybody you know, I just know a lot of people are struggling a lot more and it, and it's, so I feel like I've found a, a different kind of gratitude than I had previously, which That's is lovely. really important. Yeah. yeah. 
and yeah. for other people and people's struggles you know i've struggled but to sort of yeah. go you know that you know to and to recognize privilege yeah. too you know that's right. Which, that's right and to just be grateful for what you have and and the life that you have you know because some people are having it so much worse so yeah. you're very fortunate well, exactly. Deb, what a dynamic woman you are. I'm so <laughs> happy to have had this opportunity to chat with you. I am going to call Jess back in. Okay. I want to thank you for, for joining us today. Done. <laughs> yeah, this is so much fun to talk to you too, Greta. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thanks, Deb. So Jess, it's a, fun, it's a fun ride, right? It's like, a, it's like, oh, the ride's already over? Oh, I feel like we, were, <laughs> I we were cruising and now the ride's over. Um, no, I, yeah, I was... Uh, thinking as you're talking about like women right now and mm -hmm. there's a I don't know if it's NPR or where I read it but they were showing a chart of like the different have you, either of you guys seen this about the different like the workforce so the different like sectors of the workforce and and based on like race and age and where we all were before the pandemic and then the drop that happens like the collective drop and then the rise and the line that does not rise is uh, is women of a certain age with children. Like mm -hmm. that line stayed down here, you yeah. know, about employment picking back up for multiple categories, except for women with children. And it is it is absolutely, you know, I think it'll be an interesting thing to see as we reemerge what like new minor pandemics we're dealing with, you know, uh -huh. coming out of this, which is women in the workforce <laughs> is yeah. gonna be one of them. Yeah. You know, and then how do you yeah, how do you restabilize that? Yeah, I did read that there was a dip in in women in the workforce in general, like yeah, the pandemic and probably after. You know, and it just it begs a lot of questions too, like you know, right? Daycare, you know, childcare. Well, that's like that. yeah, that's it. And I think that's the that's the category that's taken a large hit because oh. while this all happened, you know, then it becomes the most fiscally responsible looking decision to be the person at home and there and then there's the other like you're talking about the social emotional elements of things too which is you know that's these these laymen are also being on the ground trying to figure out how to handle the social emotional health of their progeny in the middle of a worldwide pandemic you know and our parents didn't train for this so we weren't trained for this so you know it's there's yeah. a lot I'll never forget when it when it first hit I was in class and there was you know, people checking their phones and stuff and after class these two very dear young men both freshmen because I teach like freshmen to see and, and they're like wide-eyed and staring at me as if I'm some wise old crone <laughs> and uh, they're like what what's gonna happen and I was our class is gonna be canceled what are we gonna do we have to go home I'm like dudes I don't know you know and they're like well what's happened before when <laughs> when this kind of thing happened I'm like yeah it hasn't happened in my lifetime. I'm not that old. I didn't live through the like 1919 <laughs> pandemic, you know, like a slow year roll. But you know what I mean? They were like just babies. You know, they were 18, yeah, 19, yeah. whatever you are when you're a freshman, you know, like yeah. my, and then that's some scare. And I, I was like, this is a big, big, uncharted, unknown yeah. territory, you know? And so yeah. I really wonder like what the next genera you know, generations coming up are going to be like you know and even my older son they have they're very you know it's a very disillusioning world that mm -hmm. they're entering like yeah. will i be able to work yeah. you know what i mean or you know are black lives ever gonna matter like what the nuts is happening here you know yeah. and there's yeah. a lot of things that they just feel frightened they're oh. frightened, frightened and angry and yeah. all of that and you know it's an opportunity to change things but yeah. It's also kind of an uphill battle. Yeah. You know? Lots of work. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's funny that you say that because um, yeah, during this at some point when my son was having one of his down days, you know, it, I, he was asking me kind of how I've experienced or what I've, and I realized it was again, that historical, like how did, I was like, well, I had to say to him point blank, well, hun, I never had a moment where I was like, I had a bad day at remote school from my bedroom. Cause that's like never, that never happened to me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. like there is no precedent for this, you know? And I think the, yeah, the blessing and the, and the curse is kind of the collective trauma of it all. Mm -hmm. um, and even though we can like to Greta's point earlier that like you can have gratitude for not having it worse off than you do. Um, you can also look at your neighbor and know every neighbor is holding their own trauma 
That's right, right now. And so for blessing or curse, it's kind of like, you know, the floor has fallen out, the walls, you know, smoke and mirrors have dissolved, the, the walls have come down. And so to your point, Deb, what will the next, I mean, there is no false pretenses that can be both a blessing and a curse. Throughout this whole thing, I've been saying we've like experienced the best possible version of the worst possible thing has been like my theme, you know, so you have the consolation of like, even though you're going through the darkness, like you've been given all the tools to get through this specific darkness, mm -hmm. you know, you just have to trust that, <laughs> you know, the, that alignment principle that if this had to happen, like you're talking about even school, you know, if this had happened in 2000 and whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? I didn't even have done on, online stuff, no. you know? No. Like no. my son used to ask me, why can't you homeschool me? I'm like, cause I don't know shit about anything <laughs> other than voiceover, really. You know what I mean? I can't teach you math. You know, yeah. I, you don't want me to homeschool you. <laughs> you. Are you wanting to attend the school of hard knocks? Because that's what I can teach you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Today's um, lesson is let's look at the fridge and let's figure out how to make this a meal. Like, because you've got a can of olives, not a, a bad, bologna. Yeah, right. Not that's a bad nice. life lesson to have, but yeah. Hold back. But yeah, it was like, you know, I'd have to homeschool because you couldn't really get online, yeah. you know? I mean, in the same way. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm grateful every day for like how janky my Wi-Fi used to be back in those days. Remember? Yeah. Remember yeah. those days? <laughs> oh, I was literally, I was literally talking to someone earlier and I was trying to date myself about when, you know, in my early days of being an agent, I was saying, I remember the point early on where I had to tell people about smartphones and encourage them to talk to their specific tax accountants and let them know that this would be a great business expense and ask how it could be a write-off because I really encourage them to buy something more than the base model that their cell providers offering them because it can be very useful when I want to send you a message during the workday about an audition and then you don't right. have a chance to check it so you get to your PC at home and then you're like oh I don't know the answers to this and the office is closed if you have this thing called a smartphone you know what I mean like and just that being revolutionary in and of itself you know like so it's it is crazy how the technology has raced ahead of the yeah, moment we're in you know with you know time tying it all into voiceover too it's like you know yeah. i don't know technology has changed so much in the amount of time i've been in this industry so that like when somebody says five years from now yeah it's really hard to say yeah yeah, yeah. i just had someone text me today that said something like you know because i asked her about something tomorrow and she's like i'm glad that you you also plan for 24 hours <laughs> you know and i was like i can only know how to plan in 24 hour increments like i i think that's a relative truth but also like to your point like how how can you forecast right no. like you just yeah. have to very much inform yourself in this moment about the next chapter the next step the next you know what i mean yeah so yeah, yeah. well i i will say deb thank you so much for this thank last you. hour and sharing all of your wisdom um and for those listening this is going to be on our uh youtube page as well so if there's any wisdom in here they're like i know someone that needs to hear that punch list of things that deb said feel free to go to our YouTube page, Coffer Center on YouTube and pull this stream. It's also a Facebook Live archive. Um, so you could share it with audiences that need to benefit from the wisdom that Deb just dumped on everyone today. <laughs> yep. This has been a wonderful a wisdom dumper. I'm gonna put <laughs> she is. Her, a sage wisdom, put that on your Absolutely. business card. Deb dotes her, sage wisdom dumper. There you go. I like it. This there has been go. a fabulous hour, Deb. Thank you so, so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. You guys Thank have you, a great Deb. rest of your day. Everybody. You too. You too. Bye, Greta. Bye, Deb. Bye, have a great weekend. Bye, Deb. Bye everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye.